You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, here talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona and uh, the rains. Is anyone else tired of the rain besides me? I, am I allowed to even say that in, in Arizona? But uh, humidity, oh, I just don't, I don't want any more. Uh, so it looks like we're in for a bit of a dry out, which would be nice. We are seeing just a touch of overwater stress on some of the plants coming in. A couple deaths I've seen this week, but mainly it's just some leaves are spotting. Uh, Here's what happens when plants get too much rain in addition to or supplementing your irrigation and rain both. Sometimes you can actually overwater your plants and they'll stress out on you. They'll start to turn yellow. They'll shed some leaves. They'll stop flowering. Uh, They just have this, they can get spotting on the leaves. And so we're seeing a lot of mildew uh, happening. So this powdery white coating on the foliage, those are all indications of it's just been really wet, humid. So Arizona plants like to be, they like to dry out in between their water cycles, their water rain events. And so you'll see this. What happens is the, the soil will load up with moisture. You fill up all the air pockets in the soil with water molecules and the plants they're rooting out. They just, they can't breathe. Roots must breathe. They must have oxygen. It'd be like holding your little puppy dog down underneath the pool for 10 minutes straight. It's that effect on a tree, only it takes a little bit longer for that plant to literally drown. And so you'll see your evergreens. They'll just turn brown and just shed their needles like that. Just, just all at once. The damage was done two, three weeks months ago, but it just gave up the ghost and went, I'm done, and just sheds all of its foliage. And so kind of watch that. I've been uh, watering our our landscapes about once a week, Uh, and I've got a lot of new plants, but about once a week seems to do it. Uh, Some of the native uh, established things, I've backed off to every 10, 14 days. It just depends on, on how mature the plants were. So you need to play with your irrigation. You can't set it once and you're done. You got to actually tweak it because of the way our water cycle, our, our monsoon rains, the moisture hits the mountains of Arizona. It just hits all at once between August and September, and then it will dry out and we may not see moisture. Remember last year, those of you that, that kind of wintered with us last year, remember the last rain was in November and we didn't see another rain event at least here in the Prescott area, which I would assume most of us are similar, uh, the the last rain event in November, and then it didn't rain again until June. We had a hurricane come up from Mexico and, and dump on us, and then it really didn't rain again until the monsoon pattern started the 1st of July, which is more normal for us. Usually, almost always, we have a moisture event midwinter, usually end of February. March is generally a wet month for us. But I've seen, uh, I mean, I've been snowmobiling in Prescott in November. You, you, just see, you just never quite know how much moisture we're going to see. It's intermittent. So kind of watch that. You want to tweak your irrigation. And then also, we've had some tremendous plantings. Those of you that have been into Waters Garden Center this week and bought big, I mean, big landscapes. Uh, like we're going to plant these large, like full on the whole front, front yard. Now, thank you. Uh, if you're doing that, it's a great time to be planting, but you'll need to remember that water cycle. If we have an event like we did last winter, uh, rained in November and then no more moisture through winter, you're going to have to supplement some watering for those new plants. Not very much. Just give it a, give it a good dose couple times a month. If we happen to have a snow event, if we happen to have some winter rains, you can back one of those off, but at least once a month, you want to water through winter. So plant now. It's a great time. You'll get a flush of new growth in, in, you know, through the fall of roots. You'll get a flush of roots. And then you'll get another flush of roots next spring. So it really makes for a robust plant. 
next summer, which is the hardest months. June is your difficult month to grow things. That's when you're really challenged. But right now, you'll, you'll get more root mass underneath that plant by planting now than you would uh, by waiting till next spring where you'd only have half the root mass. So that's something to kind of watch. It's just if you're planting in the autumn, tremendous time, just make sure you water through winter a couple times a month. It's that simple. If you turn your irrigation off and then you don't even think about your landscape for six months, you're going to have some death and decay. I don't care if it's brand new plants or established old old plants. I think a lot of this uh, this Leland cypress canker that's it's taking out a lot of the Leland cypress, I think a lot of that was accentuated by last year. If you didn't water and keep those plants healthy, you're really struggling to keep those plants alive right now because this canker, it, it's disease, got established and it's wiping out entire rows of Leland cypress. So keep your plants healthy. Now, if your plants are turning yellow too soon, so I'm seeing some uh, maples turn too soon, some aspens. Believe it or not, you can overwater an aspen. I mean, they're a native Arizona plant. They, they're they used to our cycle, but if they load up with moisture at their root root zone, they'll, they'll turn. They actually will turn color and shut down. They're going, I am just too stressed out. I am not feeling good. I'm going to put myself to bed. And so they just check out early and they, they, Hope that they will dry out and be able to recuperate next spring. So if you're seeing that, some your plants are turning fall color too soon. It's not fall yet. We still got a month to go. Some plants, two months. I mean, a long time before we're seeing any kind of autumn colors showing up. If you're seeing that show up early, earlier than your neighbors, that's because it got too wet. Or the most likely right now with all the moisture is it, it was too moist. And so it's it's stressed out, so it's checking out. It could be grubs, something obscure, but now we're into the really the one, two percent of problems it could be. The ninety percent was it was probably too got too wet. With our heavy clay soils, it stayed too moist, and so it's turning colors early. It's shedding some leaves early. It's got spotting of the leaves. The tips will turn black or brown. Those are all indications I'm just wet. And this soil is staying too moist for me. So watch my irrigation. So that's one back your irrigation off, hit the skip cycle. If you see some rain. So anyway, that that's, we've got a lot in store for you. This show right now, it's the, uh, javelina. Oh, the javelina are wreaking havoc on the gardens. So if you didn't fence them out, or if you're just, you're planting and they come in these wild pigs at almost all elevations as a kid, we never really had Havelina up in the mountains in Prescott. We'd go, I'm a hunter, so outdoorsman. I'd go down to New River or Congress. They were always at the lower, that high desert area. Well, they've made their way up to pretty much most of Arizona, and they're spreading more. These herds of 10, 15, 20 piglets, pigs, hogs coming in, uh, the, the, and they root up or they rototill your gardens. Sometimes you'll plant a new thing that they aren't even, they don't even like. They're just in, they're interested in the soil underneath that new planting. They notice animals in your landscape. They notice new things in their environment. They're going, whoa, well, that's new. I went over there last night, Bob. Hey, let's go check it out. See what's going on. And they'll go root up to see what's underneath the roots. Sometimes I think they just like to have fun. They'll rip it up and throw it up in the air. They'll trump on it. They'll pass a baton going, hey, you try this. This is fun. They don't eat it. They just are just destroying things. So I've got some uh, tips this show. Probably at maybe the bottom of the hour, we'll start segment five. We'll get into plants, the javelina don't eat, which is also going to be plants that the rabbits, uh, not so much pack rats, but deer, rabbits, javelina, antelope, they, they probably don't eat either. So we'll hone in specifically on on uh, javelina. And then I've had some pack rat issues. I'll probably cover that one too. So a lot. And so we've got Lisa Waters Lane coming into the studio with your garden questions. We'll see what's up with that. We'll be right back with more on The Mountain Gardener. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. 
Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our timeless beauty, Desert Willow. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unusual water selection is prized for its long bloom time without setting the usual seed pods. The flowers are highly attracted to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native, and just $49. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to bloom, they love to shop. Hi, Kenneth Waters with our Monster Monsoon Sale, our only sale of the year. Truckloads of fresh autumn maple, aspen, and spruce have just arrived, and we need room, so summer plants must go. Perennials, trees, shrubs, even pottery must go, and it's worth your while with plant sales at 25, 45, even 65% off. It's Waters' only sale of the year at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love great plants at sale prices, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She brings each week your garden questions. Just what are what are your neighbors talking about that maybe you can learn from? So this thing called gardening... You, you never learn it all. Isn't that amazing? So it's just about the time you think you have it, the rules change or the environment <laughs> changes or ah, this this year it's like too much rain. How do you change? And that's also the fun part of gardening is each year is unique, different. You gotta you can't just do it once and it's rote. It, you have to actually work with the environment, not against it. So welcome back to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. So we had uh, we you and I. Travel mm-hmm. buddies to Portland, Oregon last week. So yes. we lock in. This, people may not know. It's, it's, we should share this with them. Uh, Oregon, their number one industry right now is container potted plants. So they grow container plants for the country. Mm-hmm. It's almost it's $986 billion industry. Uh, it now outpaces cattle and dairy as a number one. You know They break down in the ag department. The different, uh, uh, where, where's the money coming from? It's a billion dollar in one state, billion dollars. Wow. And so we were roaming around the country, uh, not really looking for new growers. We're trying to secure our relationship with our current growers mm-hmm. and then see what they're doing, see how the crops are. Go hand pick certain trees like your, your spruce and pine. You want to know. I mean, those are things, there's different grades, and you could be some really trashy grades and some glorious grades. So this uh, uh, cream of the crop idea of plants, this is we go up to get the cream of the crop, and so you and I, we had uh, dinner every night with a grower. We had we logged seven hundred miles <laughs> just around Portland. This is from Salem up to Beaverton. I mean, all over that area. Okay. So we fly in and just rent a car and just log miles and go look at crops. Just, mm-hmm. I was I was beat. You were beat. Yeah. There. Oregon doesn't really have a highway system. <laughs> I mean, no, you're right. No infrastructure. Yeah. We want no money on infrastructure. No infrastructure. <laughs> it was very interesting using the GPS, getting around yeah. there because it's turn on Old South Mill Road for two miles, then turn on New South Mill Road for three miles. Yeah. Like, you're just like, are we ever going to get there? Where the heck are we? But we made our way around and, yeah. and saw a lot of the farms and, and saw what they were doing. It is nice to see them coming back from yeah. the recession. True. They're actually putting in new uh, grows in and it's looking at developing new trees and shrubs. And that's always great to see. New introductions. New, we've got some fabulous, I mean, just new introductions. The quality is increasing. The sizes are increasing. So, which is nice. We were in this uh, doldrums, and I think that started last year, and it's really progressing. You see the notice. Yeah, yeah th- this growth that we see of a building, you're now seeing it float down to the grower level. And they've got a plan five to ten years out. Right. So to have them be that confident, mm-hmm. that's encouraging. That's that's an yes. economic thing that will play out uh, in the long term for us. Still, trucking's a little bit of an issue. Yep. I, and I true. don't like Portland. I mean, you folks from Oregon... God oh, bless you're you. You're going to offend some people now. The, the, the <laughs> best rail system ever. You can get if you're in the city, you can get around. Yeah, but to get out in the country, you it's terrible, kind of terrible. But oh we saw a lot of really pretty countryside. We did, although it was kind of smoky. 
when we flew in that first day, it was, whew. Yeah, I don't like the, in downtown Portland because it smells like pot all the time. Like everything smells of weed. And then uh, the, the roads as you go outside, it was just so smoky. And then the roads are clogged because it's growing like crazy. And the roads are clogged. They don't have any enough roads. Well, now yeah. you just sound like a cranky old man. <laughs> well, I was a little tired coming off that. I'm excited for next year, though. It'll so, be fun. It'll okay, be fun. it will be. So garden question. We should probably go out of the cranky old man mode and go into... <laughs> Entertain us with Cranky great Garden questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Mark lives out in Chino. He has something that is eating the bark off his peach tree. Large Ooh. pieces are missing towards the bottom of the tree. He wants to know, is there anything he can do to help the tree to survive at this point? Or what do you do? They're, they're not going to believe us. Anyone in Chino Valley, Paulden, you're not going to believe. But trust me, this is real. Uh, you have porcupines. That's they they come in at night, mm-hmm. big old like as big as a raccoon or maybe bigger. And porcupines love to eat the bark. Uh, the the cambium layer underneath the bark is really sweet, mm-hmm. especially on fruit trees. And so my guess is they're they've got some porcupines coming in and they're they're peeling the bark off. And it'll it'll sit there every night and they'll just keep stripping the bark off the tree till the tree gets um, uh, girdled mm-hmm. and it will die. So what to do? Uh, I would say for that tree, uh, they, they, we, we have a tree paint. It's like black tar looking stuff. For a fruit tree, don't use just any product because they're toxins. Some of these tar based things are very toxic, and you don't want to get your fruit tree loaded up and it carries into next year's fruit. But there's organic or non toxic tree paint that you can use. You, you paint that wound black and then you wrap it with a tree wrap. There's a fabric kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that should keep the porcupine because he doesn't want to compete with that. You, the goal is to get him to move to your neighbors and have them eat their fruit trees, their cherries, their apples. Their, they really like any kind of fruit tree. But I predict it's a porcupine. And that mm-hmm. every time you tell someone that, I go, oh, no, I've never seen a porcupine. I'm going, and you never will. They, right. They're nocturnal. They're in at like 2 o'clock in the morning. So it's, but that's what I'm thinking it is. Come in right away because the tree is wounded. Mm-hmm. It'll keep weeping and it'll be an issue, and the it will, the the damage will keep spreading unless we get on this. So come in right away. Chino Valley is just a few miles away. Come in, talk to us. We'll tell us you've got porcupine, and we've seen it so many times. We'll show you exactly what to do. So you definitely want to get it treated in a wrap. Do you think it's worthwhile to fence it, or do they climb the fences? They do climb somewhat. They can climb, so they're kind of like a raccoon. They'll go right up the tree. I've seen the elm trees. They'll be up on the crotch of the tree, but generally they're at the major crotches and down by the bar, uh, the trunk area. I don't know if you can keep them out. All you can do is discourage them from chewing on that portion of the tree, and usually the tree wrap will do it. But that particular porcupine will tell you when you when you wrap it, it keeps coming back and it tears through it. You go, oh man, I better maybe yeah. I better fence it. So fencing okay. can't hurt. Is it worth the extra energy? If you got fencing laying around, great. If not, yeah, probably just the tree wrap is good enough. Okay. Vicky in Prescott says right now she has some beautiful roses, which the roses are looking fabulous are. right now. She was out deadheading and noticed a lot of the um, leaves were sticky. Wants okay. to know that normal? Is there an insect there? Yeah. What What do you think? So good for you, Vicky. Deadheading, getting them. I mean, we're coming into the best of the rose flowers coming in now. Now fall is really the first flush of growth which really isn't as good because thrip and aphids are on things. They kind of damage some of those early buds. The fall buds for roses are actually more spectacular, larger, more buds. And so that's good. Just deadhead them, fertilize them, and they will flush a whole other set of growth, a whole other set of flowers. Mm -hmm. The sticky thing, now I'm guessing, uh, you kind of help me on this, but aphids? I I would would guess aphids. It's early though. So you you can look and find them. No. Yeah, and a rosarian would yeah. know what to look for. But what they do is they'll pierce the, the leaf and they'll excrement will be sticky sap and will kind of settle down on other leaves underneath that. So look above where the sticky leaves are. Look on the on the growth above that. Mm-hmm. And usually that's where the aphids are. Right. And that's where the damage is. And easy to kill an aphid. Come in, we mm-hmm. can wipe them right out, keep it organic. Uh, and then, But if, if you don't do that anything... They'll actually take some of your buds. You'll have smaller flowers, and they'll damage some of the the flowers that are to come. Mm -hmm. So aphids are what you got. Yep. 
So our next question is from Patty. She has a Russian sage that's taking over the world at this point. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's kind of a blocking a walkway by her house. Yeah. She wants to know, can she trim it this time of year? Is it going to make it look funky? What do you do? So Russian sage, I think Russian sh- sage, they need to be replaced every few years anyway. They just too tin, they sprawl. And so what we do is we'll keep ours pruned back. The lower branches will prune up so it creates more of a vase shape. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be enough for her walkway. I would start with that and get a feel for it. But if if you prune it back, those lower branches, and still it's too wide, I would say dig it up. (laughs) It comes, pops right out with a shovel. Mm -hmm. And come in and get another $10, $15, one-gallon plant. Plant that, and it will... You'll be set to go for another five to seven years, and eventually that one will find there's this cycle that we should get into of putting some fresh new plants in because they do get old and woody. They start stop blooming as well. The, the, the lower branches will take over. I would, I would say look at that. Prune it back at the bottom. If not, just replace it. And now's a good time to replace it. Yep. Uh, so Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners, be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Waters with our annual native plant sale. No scraggly natives here. These are big, bold local specimens bound to inspire. From native pines to the largest selection of agave and yucca, even Waters Cactus are blooming in celebration. The landscape doesn't have to be natural and boring. We specialize in native wildflowers that bloom locally for easy care color. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love local natives, they love to shop. High Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Buzz Butterfly Bush. Buzz is Prescott's first patio-sized butterfly bush. These superior magenta flowers outshine our local natives and the perfect size for courtyards and patios. Add some fashion color to that native landscape or simply give to mom as a gift. It's simply that pretty, all for under $40. You'll only find them at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love magenta flowers love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So now I should cover the kind of, what what are the traits that you should look for in your plants? If you're up in that wildland interface where you're getting pressure from deer and javelina and rabbits and pack rats, what are the traits of the plants that the animals, have, they've just been trained over the generations. Oh, no, don't bother those. Those are nasty. Those are just give you a stomach ache. Those, are, those don't taste good. Those give your throat feeling dry. What are those uh, types of plants? And, and animals are trained. Don't look at that one. It's, not, it's no good. Here's what they're really, the plants that have built up a natural defense for repelling animals, here are the traits. And when you're going through the garden center, coming in here, you can look for these and you go, oh, that's probably going to be uh, pretty much animal proof. And they will be. I'll give you exact plant varieties, the names, and I've got a list I can, I'll can. i make available here at the garden center. But the traits you're looking at, if you're in the White Mountains listening and you're tuned in from Flagstaff or Payson, you can't make it to get to the list here at Waters Garden Center, then tune in. Here's what you're looking for. King, Kingman, I mean, Sligman, you folks that are tuned in from all of this is what you're looking for right here. Uh, the plants that are blue, they've got blue, uh, you notice a lot of Arizona plants. They've got this blue hue, this secretion, this color. Is it like a classic Arizona silvery blue color? Uh, the, the junipers are that color. Many of your um, salt wing uh, sumacs, uh, saltwing bush, uh, creosodes, a lot of your native plants have this blue color to it. Uh, generally speaking, the deer won't eat blue spruce because it's got this blue color to it. So they're trained. When you see the color blue on a perennial, a shrub or a tree, eh, probably not worth probably not worth the energy. That'll just leave my 
my stomach feeling bad. And here's a little insider tip. When you take, go out to that Colorado spruce and it's a beautiful, I mean, just beautiful silver color. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how blue this thing is. If you were to take your thumb and rub that over, over the branch and over the needles, that blue will actually come off. It'll actually fade. So the inside of a blue spruce or generally it's green. So after a season or two, that the rains will have that blue melt off or just fade. The new growth, which is the tender part, the tasty part of a plant has this blue secretion. The plants have trained themselves. They've just changed so that they can protect their new growth. The, the older, tougher growth, they go, yeah, don't put all your energy on that blue color on the new growth. So many plants are like that. It's a defense to keep the animals away from that plant. Many of your shrubs have a blue color, uh, like blue, uh, what is that, uh, Russian sage, one that's blooming right now. It's got a silvery blue. But you'll also notice if you take a close look at Russian sage, the foliage also has a texture to it. It's not straight, you know, waxy leaf to it. It actually has this surface texture. So you'll see uh, sycamores. You'll see the back of the leaf. The, the front of the leaf is green. The back of the leaf is white. That's a secretion that it's the plant is throwing off on the leaf to when that when the animal eats that, that that white powder on the back of that leaf will get stuck in their throat and they're kind of going, oh man, oh, oh that's nasty. Oh, I don't want to eat any more sycamore leaves. It's a defense the plant has actually used. So anytime you see two-toned leaves, generally that's a plant's defense to keep animals away. Not every time, but most of the time. If you see a texture to the leaf or the stem, like right now the echinacea or coneflower are spectacular. This perfect perennial for the mountains of Arizona comes in a host of colors. It stands about a foot and a half high, but if you take a close look of the flowers, this five, six inch flower, it's in full bloom in oranges and purples and pinks and all kinds of colors. If you look just underneath the flower, you'll see the stem has these hairs that protrude up and down the stems. The bottom of the leaf of every leaf of an echinacea will have these same hairs showing up. This is a defense thing that says, uh uh, don't eat me. I'll make you you'll get all those hairs will get stuck in your throat. You are gonna have to you're gonna have to leave right away to go get a drink of water because I'm gonna leave your throat stuck with all of these hairs. That's a defense the plant has come up with to defend itself from animals. So why prickly pear? You would think that javelina would not eat prickly pear, but they do. They've got these uh, enzymes in their lips that kind of numb their lips. And so they, they could eat that for a water source, nutrients and water. Uh, so they just chomp right through it. So not every time. So cacti generally are not proof. A needle isn't what you're looking for. It's the, it's the texture of the leaf that you're looking for. So that, that's kind of, that's a tricky one. The hedgehogs, uh, th those are short little tiny cacti. They're just covered, literally covered in needles. Generally those, they don't eat, but the prickly pear, they will go figure. Another one is if it's got a, a real sappy, like a, a colored sap, like euphorbia, that's another indication the plant has actually tainted its sap within the structure of the plants. When a plant, when, a, when an animal eats it, it goes, "Ooh, this is nasty tasting." Uh, so you'll see that some of them are actually almost to the poisonous stage, like daffodils. You know, animals don't eat daffodils. Javelina will not bother daffodils because of their sap, the internal mechanism. Actually, it's almost poisonous, so they won't eat it. Make them very sick to their stomach. Those are all ways to look, things to look for as you're roaming around uh, the nursery. Those are traits you're looking for that are kind of bulletproof for, for animals. Lisa Watersling coming back with her, her take, and then I'll go through a plant list. Uh, some things you can plant now that the animals won't bother. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust. 
how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. I hate weeds. Monsoon rains are so refreshing, even my landscape comes alive, but so do my weeds. Stop weeds in their track in one simple step. Waters Weed and Grass Stopper spreads like fertilizer. It kills weed seed before monsoon rains allow them to sprout. No need to weed. It's safe for trees, even flower beds, and so much safer than that toxic waste the big box sells. Weed and Grass Stopper, it's just $24 and only found at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. And we're back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. This part of the show is all about that uh, artistic flair that you have in the gardens. Just how do you bring more fragrance and color and textures? And the fall, this, this late summer, early fall season is a it's a traumatic, not traumatic, dramatic <laughs> uh, time of year in the garden. Everything's mature and the wind's blowing and things are blooming and pluming and showing off. It's just a great time to be planting. So Lisa comes in and shares her insight into gardens here in the mountains of Arizona. Welcome back, Lisa. Oh, thank you. So what kind of things you got for us this week? I mean, you're getting all those fall crops coming in or... or so we do a lot of, we've been getting a lot of calls, people going, you know, when, when's the fall stuff coming in or yeah. the cool season veggies and it is starting to arrive now. That's good. And, uh, the other thing I would point out is a lot of people don't realize you can do fall lettuces, kale, Swiss chard, those kind of things this time of year. And it's a terrific time to grow them. It doesn't have to be just a spring crop. Yeah. We were helping some friends on, uh, when was that? Monday. And they had planted lettuce in May, and it was just sitting there in the garden, bolted, tasted bitter. Went, you just, lettuce grows great. Going, I'm not going to plant any more lettuce. I'm going, well, you, you should, because it's so easy to grow here. You just, you just got the season wrong. So you need to plant in March and April lettuce, not May, going right into the heat, because they, they don't like the heat. Right. And then pull those out, pull out that spent eggplant, the, the the ugly zucchini makes some room in that garden mm -hmm. to, so you can plant some spinach and kale and the fall crops. Mm -hmm. So you can be planting those now and they, they prefer to be planted when it's starting to cool off. You're getting right. that tinge in the air. It's just not as hot. That's what those fall crops mm -hmm. prefer. Mm -hmm. So I noticed we have a, in the backyard, the yellow snapdragons just yeah. started to show off this <laughs> week. So they've, they were so hot for so long. They right. finally went finally, Time to bloom again. Yeah, definitely. So just to touch on that, you have on the our website, there's a great garden calendar. Yeah. Um, that Especially if people new to the area, check that out on the Waters Garden Center website because it gives you really good insights of when to plant certain crops. It's called the Garden veg the Vegetable Calendar. And if you go under the very top, it says Learn. So if you hit the Learn button, and then all of our handouts, all of our garden tips... Mm -hmm. There's different tip sheets in oh, there. Totally. All of them are right there, and vegetables are, off, of course, how to grow a great tomato, how to grow rhubarb, potatoes, asparagus. They're all right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely a good resource for people to look at. But, yes, we have the first crop of cool season veggies. Yay. And some of the ones that I just really like, I mean, there's lettuce, and then there's lettuce, right? So I love the lettuces that have a lot of color and texture to them because you can grow them in a container with some of your pansies or your snapdragons. So they're edible, but they also add a lot to your containers. The ones that I really like are the speckled lettuce. Uh, just a, It's not a real tall lettuce, but it has that green and red kind of variegation to it. It's just yeah. a really neat look, especially in the pots. You're making my mouth water. It must be close <laughs> to lunch or something. Could be. Could be. <laughs> uh, the red romaine lettuce is a really dark, almost like burgundy red. Really, really attractive in those pots, especially if you put it in with like maybe the Swiss chard. Um, the Swiss chard bright lights has... Uh, red stems it has green stems it has yellow stems kind of gives you that variegated look in there beautiful really, in pots. Really, really yeah cool. good idea mm -hmm. and of course we also have a lot of the kales coming in not we're getting ornamental kales but we're also yeah. getting the edible 
kales that come in, which I think there's a lot of really cool edible kales, the, um, the dinosaur, the blue dwarf kale, a lot of different colors and textures even in kale. The edible kales. Mm -hmm. Well, I love it. Your soup of Descano. Oh, can't wait till the nights get cool and you start making your soups again and fresh kale in those. (laughs) Oh, it's so good. And then we juice kale. We it's good. It's a good way to and smoothies. Yeah, definitely. Um, We're also getting. We still have some of those cool season uh, herbs. So like your parsley, uh, the curled in the Italian, some of the oregano's. Those are really fun to put in your containers, too, or get going in your herb garden. It's a great time to get those things going in there because especially things like oregano's and the mints, they'll come back every year. Uh, parsley is what they call what a biannual. It comes yeah. back two to three years. and then It, it reseeds every you Once you plant parsley, you can't you get rid of it. You, it <laughs> the one plant may only last for a couple of years, but there'll be mm. another plant right next to it as it reseeds. Right. And that those are all ones they don't like. That spring planting, they don't like to be planted in May Mm -hmm. and then go through that summer heat. They just bolt and struggle. They prefer being planted now. And you'll harvest kale through winter. Easily. uh, Parsley struggled. I mean, just Mm -hmm. barely kept alive. Now it's it's just vibrant. It's just Mm -hmm. growing like crazy because it prefers that cool coolness in the evening. Right. So you're you're correct. It's definitely time to take a... A good, healthy look at your garden and go, okay, <laughs> those tomato plants, they've just had it. Yeah. You know, they got diseased or they got too hot. Go ahead and yank them out. Get rid of them. Um, that's zucchini that's taken over the world. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> or summer squash. But it has like one zucchini on it. I mean, it's time. You can. I give you permission to pull those things out. Um, and get your, get, do you, I guess my question is, so if you're going to get rid of those old plants, put new ones in, do you need to add some more fresh soil in your opinion? It's always good because the, the vitality is in the soil. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're, let's see if it's in containers or a raised bed, I try to be pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. So when you're pulling that plant out, look for ways to get, get those old roots out of there, make a hole, make a space in that garden so you can add some freshness, some fresh potting soil. Mm -hmm. Then when you're all planted, sprinkle some all-purpose food at the top of that so you replenish the nutrients within for the other plants that remain Mm -hmm. and for the new plants that you just put in. If you're you're just replacing a few of the plants, uh, not all of them, that's a great way to kind of increase the vitality for all in that same pot. If you're just replacing one new, you know, taking the tomatoes out and all new kale, everything's going to be replaced. Then I might take the top layer out of that, uh, not all the pots, mm-hmm. soil I would I would replace, especially a really big pot, right. it'd be expensive. Mm-hmm. But that top layer, you can add the first 8, 12 inches and put new new soil in. Be, mm-hmm. The plants will, will like it. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, some of those plants... They're, it's just tiresome. You get a zucchini that's got mildew all. Get get rid of that dog. It's t- it's five feet across. Yeah. You don't need it anyway. When you start to take some of that out, mm-hmm. free up some space, the plant looks fresh and right. new and not overgrown and ratty and mm-hmm. diseased. Sometimes it's just I'm looking to get rid of some old tomatoes that just yeah. you know they aren't producing like I thought they would or mm-hmm. they've they got some disease. You look to add some freshness. And I've, I've done that actually in our color pots too, because we're, we're now starting to get, like I said, the ornamental kales, the snapdragons, um, all those cool season plants are coming in. So it's a good time to look at your ornamental pots or flower gardens and go, oh yeah, that that petunia's just had it, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it's, it's a good time to pull it out and go look for a fresh snapdragon that's going to give you months and months more of color. Um, you know, I think sometimes people just they they want to wait till it freezes yeah. before they start putting new things in, putting the cool season in. But you should be doing it now. Yeah, give it time to fill out, flush out, fill in, and then the color you're seeing at the garden centers now. So these are flowers, edibles, and and, and flowers. If we got pansies coming, snapdragons, soon. Uh, yes, soon, but not quite. Can't <laughs> wait. As soon as you get those. Look to put them in so they will fill out. And yeah. all the things you plant now, you're seeing come into garden centers now, they will stay that color right through winter. 
Mm-hmm. I would say for Payson, Kingman for sure, uh, Camp Verde, Cottonwood, Sedona, for sure we are in this temperate zone where it will just keep blooming and blooming right January, bloom. Mm-hmm. Uh, February, it's going to bloom. The higher elevation, the Kingman, White Mountains, Flagstaff, you know, that next click above, it'll keep blooming through the end of the year at least. Mm-hmm. Then it may take a break or be a little rough looking in January. <laughs> yeah. You know, by the end of February, March, Starts to warm up and they start to be nice again. again. Yeah, so mm-hmm. definitely good good advice on on things you can put in now mm-hmm. that will keep looking good right through winter. Thank you, Lisa. Be right back with more on the Mountain Gardeners. Don't change that dial. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona, with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Prasithia already flowered? Hylacs languishing in the heat? Spring bloomers already pooped? Butterfly bushes are going strong and rebloom all summer long. Pollinators like butterflies and hummingbirds love butterfly bush for their fantastic fragrance and bright summer colors. These tough head high beauties love summer sun and bloom nonstop. Fresh new plants just arrived at the place where people who love butterflies and butterfly bushes, they love to shop. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi Kenneth Waters with our Monster Monsoon Sale, our only sale of the year. Truckloads of fresh autumn maple, aspen, and spruce have just arrived, and we need room, so summer plants must go. Perennials, trees, shrubs, even pottery must go, and it's worth your while with plant sales at 25, 45, even 65% off. It's Waters' only sale of the year at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love great plants at sale prices, they love to shop. Let's go into the actual plants. We've described what type of plants animals aren't going to bother or least likely to bother. We've gone over the soil. They're just interested because you've got a new plant out there. They, they're looking at going, oh, what's, what's here? Let's dig this up. Not because the plant is there because they're interested in worms or something else underneath the soil. Remember, their main protein source for javelina, for skunks, uh, for really in, it's, it's insects. And so they'll dig down, look for earwigs and worms and grubs. And so they'll dig up and throw your plant aside just to dig up and roll in and think about and snort and waller and play in your garden just because it's something new. So they'll do that for trees, shrubs, whatever. So you, you pick those things back up the next morning, plant them, and then you try to fence them off until they can get rooted or until the animals get used to Uh, that plant being there. So all of a sudden they don't go, oh, that's a brand new plant. Where'd that come from? Let's go check it out. So javelina specifically, the wild pigs. If you can go down your street and you see plants that are in your neighbor's yard, more than likely it will also work in your yard because those uh, same, that same herd is roaming up and down the street looking at their plants going, ah, it's the same thing as what's down there, three doors. Just let's keep moving on. There are some plants, though, that just they don't like. But if you don't know where to start, look at your neighbor's yard. Then you come in, and I've got a list. I'm going to put it out by the front desk here here at Waters Garden Center. I'll have it out for the next week or so. It says Havelina Resistant Plants. So, And it's going to be on that list a lot of names you actually like and want. It's lilacs. Lilacs, they generally, they'll leave alone. Manzanita, that's a native plant that grows wild in their environment, they have no interest in it. Red hot pokers. Uh, there, there's a, a plant that's kind of spiky like a yucca, but it puts on this tall, pretty much a knee high or above uh, flower that looks like a red hot poker. Thus the name. That's a great one. Evergreen looks great. Uh, you've got your sages. Anytime you hear the word sage or salvia, or any herb, really, but sages and salvias have this real herbal scent to it. And they smell that, and they go, ugh, that's got to be nasty. Look, it smells like sage. Yuck. So that's your autumn sage, actual culinary sage. Anything that's got sage or salvia, you're almost guaranteed going to be a winner. Every garden should have snapdragons. Snapdragon's a cute little flower, stands about 18 inches tall, comes in a multitude, a rainbow of colors, and then they spread. They're like a true wildflower. They they look delicious. 
but they've got a sap in them that the animals just do not like. And so that's a good fall uh, blooming kind of plant that just keeps going. You plant it right out there, they'd be fine. You Californians, you'd love Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo. It looks delicious again. It looks soft. It's evergreen. It's, it, it doesn't have any of the characteristics I described at the bottom of the hour saying this, these are things animals look for. You know, the, the blue color, the two-toned leaves, the herbal, uh, kind of the fragrance. It, this thing doesn't have a fragrance. It, doesn't, it must have a taste that they really don't like, but it does really well. Personally, I've had peonies, a perennial peony. You folks from the Midwest, you, you love your peonies. I do too. I've had some in a raised bed right there where the javelina come through, and they just don't bother it. It's really encouraging. Butterfly bush. It's in bloom right now. Butterflies are all over it. comes in several different heights. But believe it or not, it's, that's one of those that has that texture to the foliage. So they, they won't eat that. They don't like it. So javelina just keep grazing and go on by. If you see a flower that's got carnations, or dianthus in the name. They're kind of related. They're sort of uh, uh, the same plant, but animals, because the foliage of a carnation is generally blue with this bright, big, big pink, white, red flower to it. But that's a great one. Uh, California poppies. Again, it's in their native environment, so they just naturally leave California poppies alone. For those of you that have had erosion issues, oh, the rains have really caused issues. There's a couple ground covery kind of shrub-like things. One's catoniaster, or people call it cotton easter. It's kind of how it's spelled phonetically, but it's catoniaster. It's a great evergreen ground cover. Most of them, there's three or four varieties, and not one of the varieties will have Alina bother. Not one. Uh, uh, a deer, don't care. Rabbits, leave them alone. Great evergreen has a white flower in spring. Loaded up with, with red berries uh, starting through winter. It's just every yard should have one. But if you've got erosion control, it's one plant covers about a six-foot spread. I mean, just one emitter to make this plant grow, and it just holds in six by six foot of, of, of landscape. It's great ground cover. A companion plant we often put together for hillsides, uh, up along driveways, where those washes are, tend to gather, we'll put honeysuckle. There's a lot of different kinds of honeysuckle you can use, but that traditional honeysuckle, the Hall's honeysuckle, H-A-L-L, -L, Hall's honeysuckle, that's the one as a kid you'd pull out the stamens and suck the nectar. Well, it's a great, great. Hummingbirds love it, but javelina don't. Uh, your, your, your butterflies love it, but the pack rats don't. I mean, your, your swallowtails love it, but the, the uh, jackrabbits and the deer leave it alone. Honeysuckles are really good. And they're drought hardy, minimal care. Again, plant one, and it will cover about a 10 by 10 square foot space. It's really great for big rock yards where just kind of it's too too rock, too much rock. Need needs something soft. Honeysuckle is a great one. I've also done in that same line, you'll see it, you have a pie college. They've, been, they've done a really good job with trumpet vine. It's a great big red flower to it. And they're using it as ground cover, and they use that one to climb up big uh, structures. It's very, very versatile. So again, this, this list is extensive. There, there's no way that I can go over all of them. I'll mention a couple more, but uh, s some things to go with. The, the list is free. Just, just ask for it. It's, it's yours. So we want you to be more successful. A lot of the plants on this javelina-resistant plant list are herbs. So you'll see things like lavender rosemary, uh, oregano, thyme, creeping thyme. It's a beautiful plant, uh, very robust, very hardy, takes full blistering hot sun, but minimal water care, and just animals don't bother it. So many, I would say most of your herbs, I've heard basil being eaten by a few animals, especially this year early on, uh, but, but not generally speaking, they don't like any of the herbs. Basils are kind of on that edge. One that Lisa and I use often is Santalina, or uh, what's the other one? Cotton lavender is the common name, but Santalina, we use going up and down our stairs. We've got a two-story garden, so steps going from the driveway down to the back, back area. We use Santalina as a bright, 
It's a silver colored herb. So it has a fragrance. It's got the silver color, pretty yellow flowers. And it's evergreen. We use that to mark the stairs. If you're leaving our backyard from a backyard party and it's dark, even though we have lighting, it's still dark. Uh, These plants, Santalina kind of glows and helps you find your space. Helps. It's almost like pillars of light going up to the front to the front yard so we have less accidents never had anyone trip and fall but we're purposeful we actually think through how are people how are our guests our family going to get from here to there when it's really dark out so we've got we've got lights actually in the steps but they're they're dim they're that low 12 volt lights there's artwork that kind of guides you up through of course you got to get through the cedar gates it's very pretty, but you got to think through, how do I keep things safe and bright and cheery? It's got a fragrance. Santalina herbs have a fragrance. When you brush up against them, they just fill that whole patio area up with, with herbs that you like, but animals don't. And so I'll leave you with this. Pack rats have been my nemesis. They've been roaming around. So I've caught two pack rats, two, two mice this week. I've got a, some traps set up. And then I've got bait stations out front. Don't just, just don't don't just live with rodents running around your rock pile. I would say it's okay to have a space that's yours without sharing it with vermin, especially rats. Rats are dirty. They carry disease and they eat your stuff. That's that's like the trifecta in my world. So I'd say set some trap. We can show you how to do that here, but be purposeful and then check them and trap them. But peanut butter is the secret. Inside a trap, they'll get into it, can't get away. Uh, it's really successful. But otherwise, you'll be overrun and not, they eat every, almost everything. Okay, we, be, we will close the segment out here in just a moment. Be right back with more garden tips, tricks, and techniques. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken, with our Vine of the Week and our Arizona Sunset Trumpet Vine. Huge, deep red flowers cluster to create a dramatic summer show. This vigorous vine thrives and blooms with near neglect. Fast growing to cover chain link fence, shade structures, and trellis quick. Easy to train as a ground cover up a rock face to hold soils from erosion in just $34. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love vines that bloom red, they love to shop. Ouch! Aw, oh, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. We got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now, I have to say it is exciting to see the transition from summer to fall. The summer, sometimes... the gardens just get so large. The weeds are so grow so fast. It's it's nice to have this shift, this slowdown, this uh, to, to clear out some of the old things, and then fresh plant some freshness. It's almost like the fall planting season. It's almost like a decorating season. Uh, you don't even have to plant your pots. You put pumpkins in there. It's not planted. It's just not a not a pumpkin plant. Just a pumpkin. And that's your decoration. You might paint it. You might add some flowers to the top. You might, I don't know. It's, it's unlimited. You can harvest your uh, agave stems and use them as decorations, those big, huge flowers. Uh, yuccas, the, that beautiful red flower, you can harvest those and make decorations out of them. Your harv- we grow giant pumpkins. We pick the pumpkins and bring them up front and show them off. The harvest, the harvest is still coming off pretty strong. But the second a plant stops producing, rip it out of the ground. Get rid of the headache. It's just overgrown tomato that hasn't given you a tomato in three weeks. It's not going to. The days are getting shorter and shorter at this point. And so just get rid of it. Call it and go, yeah, you're you're out of here. 
put some lettuce or kale or something that'll that'll be pretty, less maintenance and edible through the winter. So that that's kind of my my thinking with things. As a annual flower, petunias are kind of giving up the ghost. The budworms have been horrific, a caterpillar eating the flowers. I finally went, you know, the plant doesn't look that good. It's not blooming. You're out of here. And then we'll put in some snapdragons or some, uh, like Lisa was saying earlier, we'll, she'll put in lettuce, just pretty plants. I mean, sometimes you can harvest. Sometimes you just bloom through the end of the year. So it's okay to, to take something. I'm giving you permission to kill things. This is hard for you gardeners. But listen, sometimes you just got to call it and go, that ain't coming back, honey. It's It's got to go. It's bringing you down. So put something fresh and new. It'll make you feel better. And it gets you past this beleaguered, you know, I'm tired of looking at these yellow plants. I'm just tired of it. Put some freshness, some new colors. We go over a lot of this in the garden classes each week. Uh, so this week we've got coming up, it's Gardening for Newcomers is this, this Saturday. It's at 930. It's free. It'll be packed. You get a lot of great ideas. Next week is going to be even busier. September 8th, we've got the secret gardens with hedges and privacy screens. And so we're going to go over how to space privacy, which plants are best for, for uh, privacy, uh, which plants are best planted now for next spring's growth. So you can really get some, some, some big private screens going, living fences going on. We'll go deep into that. And then it's wildfly, uh, wildlife and bug prevention. Sort of what we're going over here, but in much deeper. Got an hour class. That's September 15th on grasshoppers, pack rats, javelina. We'll have the javelina list at that class. Uh, we go deep. And then lastly, uh, the last one in September. Well, I guess there's two. Fruit trees, health, health and harvest, and then planting for success in our mountain soils. That's September. Take a look at all of those at watersgardencenter.com. At the very uh, front, you'll see classes. You just pop in there and you'll get to see it all throughout the week. Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Gardens and we love helping friends. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. This is Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center, and we're here at the Garden Center floor asking customers, why do you garden? Very relaxing and interesting, and I love watching the hummingbirds in the summer. And why do you like shopping at Waters Garden Center? There's so much variety, a lot of choice, and everybody knows everything about the stuff they sell, which is very good. Waters Garden Center, helping people reconnect. At 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, the place where people who love to garden love to shop. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.